This one's going to take a little bit longer because I'm going to read you this whole thing. Uh, but it's, it's quite interesting. Okay, so I found something from, uh, this was in uh, the New York Times way back in January. Um, and it was part of the opinion page. Okay, so uh, I'll just read it to you. and You know, you can kind of get the scoop and then we'll we'll talk about it. Because um, my question is, how does uh, individual ethical conduct and right livelihood uh, fit in, you know, to me? Okay, so the, he's saying, it's written by somebody named Mark uh, Bittman. Let's say your beliefs include the notion that hard work will bring good things to you, that the golden rule is a nice thing, although it may occasionally have limits and that it's more or less every person for him or herself. Your overall guiding force is not altruism, but you're not immoral. You're a good citizen, and you don't break any major laws. This could describe many of us, most maybe, couldn't it? Kind of the average person, you know? You're not immoral, you have a standard of ethics, you know? Um, but you're not, altruism is not your basic principle, but you're also not going to be exceedingly selfish, you know, and you're going to follow the major laws and just be a good citizen, okay? So now suppose you're in the business of producing, marketing, or selling tobacco or firearms, okay? Products known to kill others sometimes. You need not be a corporate executive or a criminal arms dealer. You might be a retailer of cigarettes, yeah, a person who sells them along with magazines, a marketeer, a gun shop owner. Yeah. In any case, your conscience is clear. You're selling regulated legal products. And as long as you're obeying all the regulations, you're doing nothing illegal. Yeah. So you're just following the laws. Average citizen trying to make money to feed your family. You sleep well, believing that the government would further regulate your product if it were necessary. And if regulations were to change, you would change with them. But to act otherwise, to hold back your energy from production or sales just because of moral or social pressure, would be foolish and put you at a competitive disadvantage. Yeah, and you're just Joe Blow trying to, you know, make a living in this economy. And so, yeah, you just do what's expected and, you know, moral and social pressure isn't really what's important because you're thinking if I follow those, then I won't make as much money, then my children can't get as not, a good of an education. and. I can't go on holiday with my family like everybody else. And, you know, you just want to live the good American life. For many years, after knowing about the le lethal nature of tobacco, our government did little or nothing to limit its consumption. He, he, he set the stage with the individual. Now he's going to shift to the government a little bit. That, uh, that change, the, the, the government did little or nothing to limit its consumption. That's changed gradually in the last 50 years, and more dramatically since 1998 because of successful lawsuits and because the Food and Drug Administration often tries to pursue its mission. <laughs> <laughs> and then in parentheses, for a variety of reasons not worth going into, firearms are more challenging to regulate. Let's leave it at that for now. Okay. Okay. So suppose we pass legislation that discourages you from producing or selling tobacco or firearms, while at the same time this legislation actively encourages you or supports you to change to produce apples or cotton or washing machines or screwdrivers. Yeah, so it's the government's helping you change from one, making one thing to another, or growing one thing to growing another. As long as you can see a way to increase profit, you would probably look at the new opportunity, right? 
After all, it's not as if you want to produce agents of death. You want to make the best living you can selling stuff that's legal and that people want. Markets change and flexibility is important and the government can and does affect your business even if it's by inaction. Now, let's apply the same way of thinking to the major food, cat food categories. And for that purpose of the discussion, there are only three, which he'll list a little bit later. And let's talk about what it's like to be a farmer or producer or a manufacturer, processor, distributor, retailer of these three different kinds of food categories. Again, you're agnostics, agnostic about what you sell, but you're profit conscious. And the government can and does affect your business. It can help your business. Yeah, in quotes, you didn't build it yourself. Or hurt it, as it should, if your business is harming others. You know, the government should regulate something. So let's call the first food group industrially processed animal products. Bologna. <laughs> yeah, bologna, hot dogs, McDonald's hamburgers, you know, I mean, steakhouses and everything. Yeah, it's all industrial processed animal products. You know, yeah, you know, very few anything with, with um, you know, where the animals are treated kindly or anything. Producing and selling as much as possible is the way to go here, since the penalties for damage, uh, penalties for damage your product does to humans and animal health and to the environment, including the climate, are virtually non-existent. You know, I mean, they know that when you raise cows, the amount of um, methane that's, in, you know, released into the atmosphere is, is horrible, and then what it does to the soil afterwards is horrible, but none of that's regulated. You can treat the animals as you like and damn the consequences from salmonella contamination to antibiotic resistance to water contamination and to, of course, cruelty. There are even incentives in the form of subsidized prices for animal feed. The next food group is most easily labeled junk food. You might call it hyperprocessed. Will be polite, hyperprocessed, not junk food. This compromises, uh, comprises aisles and aisles of quote quote edibles, quote, sold in supermarkets and men and restaurants, and what is often food that is unrecognizable as such, ranging from soda and other sugar sweetened beverages to things like chicken nuggets and Pringles, and tens of thousands of other examples. Right? These are mostly made from commodity crops, especially coin, corn, soybeans, and wheat. Yeah, and who knows what's genetically changed in those food. Most soybeans now, I think, are, yeah. Federal, federal subsidies abound in many forms here, from direct payments to the ethanol mandate, to virtually unregulated land use that permits toxic over-application of fertilizers and other chemicals. There is also that same failure to recognize the public health and environmental costs of what is probably the least healthy diet a wealthy nation could devise. You could even say that the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program what is called um, SNAP or food stamps, okay, food stamps, acts as a subsidy to junk food, since nothing limits using food stamps for products that promote disease. When they first established the, the food stamp program, they let people buy anything with it because they thought people just needed the calories if they're hungry so they could get all the junk food and fattening stuff they wanted with food stamps, and that's, that's never changed. It's worth noting uh, that for the past century, the bulk of university research, much of it paid for with tax dollars, 
has gone into figuring out how to increase the yield of the crops and processes that turn out this junk that sickens. I had read some time ago about apparently they have some product some guy invented it that is um, that mothers that parents love um, to give their kids to take to school because it looks nutritious it's like a bologna sandwich some kind of sandwich and some I don't know you know a little bit of everything and something sweet at the end and and uh, everything's very very processed so it can stay package is all wrapped up you know like a lunch to go it's all wrapped up so it can stay on a shelf for weeks and weeks without the food going bad yeah and parents love it because it's all packaged just a lunch and you give it to your kid you don't even have to put the peanut butter and jelly not that that's good for you but you know to do anything to make your kid a lunch and you know all the parents are rushed and so it's it's a dream come true but I read an article <laughs> that said that the guy who invented this stuff will not let his own children eat it. Yeah, but he's making a fortune out of selling it to other people's kids. Anyway, okay, then in the third group, third food group, there's everything else from fruits and vegetables absurdly called specialty crops by the Department of Agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> so a carrot and an apple are specialty crops. Okay, to animals raised in sustainable and even humane ways. But here, disincentives abound. Farmers may be encouraged to allow some land to go follow, but not to be planted in specialty uh, crops. And research money, subsidies, insurance, market promotion, and access to credit are directed towards industrial food production, distribution, and sales. Okay. These inefficiencies make most of the real food, which is health-promoting and closer to environmentally neutral, appear to be more expensive. And then he puts in parentheses, only appear, though, because if you account for the cost of environmental and public health damage, industrially produced junk food and animal products will actually cost more. You know, because they make you sick and then we have to pay as a society to heal people who are sick because of improper diets and overweight. In a neutral or free market, there would be more room for producers and processors of fruits and vegetables to make money by responding to increased demands for wholesome food and vegetables without competing with subsidized junk food. In a sane, or let's say properly regulated market, there would be incentives for agriculture that benefited both grower and consumer with products that were less damaging to the environment and to public health. Food stamps, for example, would be restricted to use for nourishing food. Yeah. Direct subsidies might be used to encourage new farmers who want to grow specialty crops rather than for farmers working thousands of acres of corn. One could imagine, imagine, <laughs> that a government that encourages more life-giving and less disease-causing agriculture, just as one can acknowledge that sanity prevails when government steeply taxes tobacco and encourages tobacco farmers to move on to something else. Okay, Of course this is disruptive. Change the status quo and someone is hurt or inconvenienced. But the public health disaster created by our commodity-pushing agricultural policies is only getting worse and calls for the same kind of action in industrial agriculture that we've seen in tobacco and, to a lesser extent, guns. I think in a non-existent way, guns. That kind of action will happen only when we have political representatives 
who care about food, health, and the environment. I'm going to come back to that sentence. Okay. We can pressure corporations all we want, and we'll get mostly, and what we'll get mostly is healthier junk food. You know, like it was on our table the other day, the peas. Yeah, and everybody thinks, oh, pea, peas are healthy. You know, this isn't some new snack that's healthy. It's exactly like potato chips, completely deprived of any nutrition. Yeah, but it looks like it's healthy. Yeah, and a lot of the yogurt we have has so much sugar in it that it's really bad for you, but yogurt has this reputation as being a healthy dessert. Right, yeah. Lots of commercial yogurt Cultures that make it yogurt? Oh, it's more like pudding without even the, the cultures that make it yogurt. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So what we'll get is healthier junk food. Really, though, as long as sugar, as long as sugar is profitable, and 100% unrestricted and subsidized and protected, marketeers will try and get two-year-olds hooked on soda and Gatorade, not to mention the rest of us. But the job of government is not to encourage profitable, bus profitable businesses at the cost of public health. It's to regulate them so that the public is served. Who is this country for, anyway? Well, we all know that the country is for the corporations and the stockholders and the CEOs. But it is a good question. Theoretically, the country is for all of us and the government is to serve all of us. I remember some time ago, a couple of years ago, I was giving a talk at one of the churches in Spokane and McKella, when she was interviewing me, was flabbergasted that I started, I forget what I even brought up, but she was like, wow, you're talking about politics. And I'm, I'm going, to me, these are not political questions, these are ethical questions. You know, I don't see any of them as political. I don't, I'm not getting involved in politics or, you know, this. I'm talking about ethical conduct. And I think that not only individuals, you know, as individuals are we responsible for our ethical conduct, but um, co corporations and governments, groups of people are responsible for ethical conduct, you know. And, and the, uh, we had a, once with Red Hawk, remember? The previous governor, um, mayor of, of Spokane and you know, a few of us, we had a little panel discussion about <clears throat> can corporations be ethical? Can they be compassionate? And I think yes. And I think they need to be. And I think we can't just say, oh, the corporation should be compassionate. And, you know, or, or whatever. Or they should be ethical. And then just absolve ourselves of personal responsibility. Because I think we, ha we have two kinds of personal responsibility because nothing ever happens unless it starts at a personal level. Because groups and corporations and governments are only made up of individuals. So things have to start with an individual changing their mind. So I think, number one, as individuals who are members, you know, uh, who run corporations, yeah, who, who participate in government policy making, who, you know, are lobbyists or who, you know, belong to any kind of group. I think as individuals, we have a responsibility to voice our ethical concerns to the higher ups in that process. You know, and to say, look, as an organization, a government, a community, a group, we have the obligation to, to serve the people, 
you know, and not just be looking for a profit for ourselves. Okay? Okay, why is that? Because as individuals, when we go home at night, we can say to ourselves, like he was saying on the first page, I'm following the laws, I believe in the golden rule, sometimes it has to be bent, but I'm not breaking any major laws, I'm a good citizen, I'm just trying to keep my family alive, and then you know, we say, okay, therefore I have no responsibility, not even for voicing our opinions. I'm not saying, you know, sometimes you voice them and the, the company doesn't agree or whatever, but it's important that we try. It's important that we voice them, and because other people may feel the same, but everybody's just too shy to say something, yeah? But Anyway, when we go home at night, even though one part of our mind says, I don't have any responsibility, another part of our mind is like, well, you know, I'm selling junk food and I'm watching all these little kids come in and buy this stuff. And this is what they're growing up eating. And what kind of, you know, health problems are they going to have afterwards? You know, or even doctors who were, I don't know how many millions of children are on antidepressants and ADHD um, drugs now. I mean, millions of kids, they don't know the long-term results of these drugs, but they're legal. And as a doctor, you say, well, the, you know, the, the customer, because now medicine, often the, the pharmacies, um, make advertisements to the customers who then come in and tell the doctors what they want and the doctors, okay, give the customers what they want, especially if the, if the, the uh, pharmacological industry is subsidizing you as a doctor for, you know, giving out their products. And, and you feel, you know, what I'm doing is legal, it's okay. But then, you know, how do you real, really feel in your heart, you know? And so I think, you know, as individuals to look at what we're doing and as members of groups to look at what we're doing. And like he acknowledges here, it is, um, change is uncomfortable and it can be dangerous, you know, because people may not agree with you. You may have to suffer some kind of financial loss. You may have to be separate from what you what you enjoy personally, yeah? But I think at least we should think about some things, you know? There may be other factors, yeah, weighing in our decision. For example, okay, some years ago, there was one man who came to the Abbey and he uh, was very upset that, that we didn't have organic food and that uh, we, because we do have eggs that are not fertilized, so it doesn't involve killing, but we don't have eggs that were from free range chicken, you know, and we didn't have milk or cheese that was from free ranged cows, you know. So he was quite upset about that and thought that, you know, the Abbey, because of compassion, we should, you know, only eat those kinds of you know, products, yeah? And I tried to explain to him that, you know, we don't buy our own food, that we eat the food that people offer us. So we say thank you for what they give us, you know? And if people ask us, because people do, and they say, what do you need? You know, we just say, you know, fruits, vegetables, eggs or whatever, we don't specify the, you know, organic or free range or, you know, any of that, because that is more expensive. And we're living from the kindness of other people who would not buy those goods for themselves. And I don't feel that it's right for us to eat better than the people who offer us food eat. And if they don't buy those those expensive foods for themselves, there's no reason why we should, when they ask us what we need, 
say we need them. You know, I, to me that that's an ethical question that I I can I don't think is right for us to do. So I tried to explain that to him that that's why we don't do it. Yeah. I don't know how much I, I don't think I got through, but you know, I, I that for us is a mit- mitigating factor. Okay. Um, yeah. So anyway, something to think about. I want to do a few more uh, discussions on this because this one was only talking about food uh, and tobacco, and I think we should talk about other other things as well. Any comments people have? Or? I was yeah. watching the Mind Life series on creeping. Uh-huh. And one of the scientists pointed out that uh, really, uh-huh. the drug given widely, you know, for ADHD, yeah. is pharmacologically in the same family as cocaine. And she said that psychologists and psychiatrists don't like to hear this. And as a teacher, I had no idea how to shock. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying that Ritalin is in the same family as cocaine, but the pharmacies don't like to see it. And you were a teacher, so you, you know you were educating kids that were taking Ritalin. It's one of the prominent drugs given for ADD and ADHD, uh, and you had no idea about that. Yeah. And they still don't know the long-term effects of being on Ritalin. No, they don't know the long-term effects at all. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of college students go in and tell, you know, say, I can't concentrate, I'm distracted, or whatever, I have ADHD and it was never diagnosed, and they're getting Adderall and becoming addicted to Adderall as, as university and college students, you know? Mm-hmm. They're also having more research is that when children are allergic to certain type of food groups, like the corn syrups and the wheat, sometimes it shows up in certain behaviors. So a lot of this, they're starting to realize is that this ADHD is sometimes strong allergies to certain type of food groups or overprocessed food. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That it's more diet-based than they're thinking. Yeah, that sometimes the ADHD and ADD can be more, have uh, an element in them that are diet-based. I mean, if, well, I mean, gee, Manny, you're feeding kids so much sugar and corn syrup, you know, of course that's going to do stuff, but also, the, and caffeine in, in all the sodas, yeah, and then, yeah, some of the, the wheat stuff, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's the fundamental premise, right, of, of free market economics. Then you have the Great Depression, and then you say, oh, okay, government has to step in sometimes, but you've got to figure out where, and it's up to the government to. Yeah. Decide. Yeah. I yeah. was thinking that that's how a lot of modern countries are run. Okay. Yeah, so you're thinking the whole principle underlying it, that cap- capitalism will regulate itself, that the free market will regulate itself, you know, and that people will just stop buying junk food, for example. They'll realize it's unhealthy, they'll stop buying it, and then the, the people who manufacture the junk food will be forced by the market to make healthier food. No, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh-huh. They are qualified to make decisions on behalf of the nation. Right. And they make decisions like public health. Like health in Singapore is a matter of national interest. Uh-huh. So we tax tobacco like crazy because no way is tax money going to subsidize your bad habits. Yeah. So the government steps in and makes all the decisions. And you better go jogging three times a week for the national interest. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's amazing if you live in a country like Singapore. It, Singapore is much more active than our country about encouraging people to do different things, you know? I mean, we have Michelle Obama who, who was encouraging people to eat healthy food and get exercise, but how much media does she get, you know? Yeah, yeah. But like in Singapore, they, they will actively, you know, like you said, I mean, they, they really tax tobacco a lot. Yeah. But the government will put out health campaigns, you know, about go to the gym and get exercise. And does our government do that and encourage that? And yet we have all these battles because, you know, we have to pay for medical expenses for people who are unhealthy. But as a country, as a society, we don't like the government even encouraging us to get exercise, you know? Actually, you know, when you were at the very beginning, when you were talking about the Joe Blow person who's just, you know, following the law, so what came to my mind is that, and we have a whole national ethic that those people have the information, it's their choice whether they want to die or not. Right. Right. And that's right. very big. Yeah. Yeah. You have the information. It's your choice whether you want to take that or not. Yeah. Not my business, yeah. But I'm not going to pay any health expenses for you if you get sick. And I'll let my children eat that. And I'll pay for my children's health expenses, but I won't pay for your children's health expenses. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. People do have very different information. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like finding scriptural backing for something. <laughs> First you decide what you believe, then you find the research that or the scripture that establishes it. <laughs> Canada, they teach yeah. kids about nutrition. Yeah, wow, that in every grade, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we brought in the yeah the junk food machines in the high schools and grammar schools. Yeah, yeah, and then the nutrition classes we got. As kids, I remember, you know, it was three dishes, one carb, one vegetable, one meat. And that made you a good American citizen. <laughs> and that's what we had to learn. You remember eighth grade home ec? You know, preparing you to become a good wife. Yeah, and make good meals for your husband. And that was your daily diet, you know, and you served meals. Wow. But I mean, so it's a question of how far you want the government to go. Yeah. Not local, maybe not a lot, but I hear occasionally about local governments, like one like New York City and Minnesota, they make the worst of the beverages. Yeah. LA, I think, did it. I think it was LA or somewhere, maybe the whole state of California somewhere, they banned the soap machines in schools. Yeah. It takes a lot to do that. Yeah, good. <laughs> 